we're, we're forced to deal with how much God has given us compared to what we give to Him. And of course, it's dangerous preaching about money because it can come across much like advertising, can't it? Because, you know, money goes into the offering. We know the biggest, I mean, our budgets just came out. Guess what the biggest thing on the budget you have to pay for? It's, it's actually me. So this can come across as advertising. Advertising can be kind of a dangerous thing. We were uh, shopping this week, and uh, we, were, we needed to get some more cereal, so we were going down the cereal aisle, and um, there was a little bit of a sale on one particular brand, and there were a couple of different versions of this brand of cereal. I'm not going to say what brand it is, but I looked up, and, and there was kind of the boxes that appealed to kids. The cookie flavored, actually. And there were some brands that were aimed at the adults. And so there was, I took off one that was kind of aimed at the kids, it was cookie flavored. I took off the shelf one brand that was kind of aimed more at adult, it had heart wise on it. It uh, was uh, fruit and nut flavored. And we went home, we, I looked at, and for whatever reason, I looked at the nutritional aspects of these two and was shocked to notice the kids' cookie version had less sugar, less salt, less fat, and more vitamins than the adult healthy one. Go figure. Advertising is a dangerous thing, isn't it? I should be eating cookies more, I guess, is the bottom line. More cookies, less fruit and vegetables. Kind of came across as funny, that advertising. And sometimes pastors have gotten up and have preached about money and about offerings and things, and it's come across as pretty phony. But I'm going to tell you the bottom line with money is this money is not good or bad, it is a tool. Tools can be used for good, and tools can be used very poorly. I promise you, I understand that. I've used many tools poorly in my life. Stop laughing, Zoe. But they can also be helpful. Love of money, we are told in 1 Timothy, is the root of evil. If you look at a lot of our translations, it says root of all kinds of evil or types of evil. It actually says, literally in the Greek, all evil. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's this warning that we can fall into traps with money very quickly. Jesus is in the courtyard of the temple just after having a good fight. The leaders of the Jewish religion have been tossing questions at Jesus. Jesus has been responding brilliantly, and at the end of that, he gets up in front of the people and he starts blasting the religious leaders. Our version of Mark that we looked at two weeks ago, quite short, little blip about it. We're going to come to that again in a few minutes. We're going to have to come back to it, this passage. You read Matthew's version. It's a whole long chapter in which he just attack after attack, and he calls them names, and he blasts them. If you read Matthew's version, he walks out of the temple the disciples throw an innocent question at him. It seems like he's still mad. He goes on from there. But Mark and Luke have a little interlude. And it's this story. It's a story of a poor widow. And it's important that she's a widow. Who comes into the temple. And in the midst of people laying down big wads of cash. She tosses into the offering nothing. Practically nothing. Except for her, it's everything. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, Hey, disciples! I don't think he called them that, but hey, disciples, come over here. Why don't you come see this? This woman threw in nothing, but she gave lots more than those folks. We need to talk about some copper coins. Our passage ended, but truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. 
For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now we're going to come to why I don't think this is completely a compliment for the widow. But it's more a comment, not so much on this poor widow, it's more a comment on the religious leaders who have been putting stuff in the box. We need to understand that wealth is not an indication of God's blessing. Nor is ability or nobility or wealth, none of those are indications of our value in the kingdom of God. A couple of years ago, I did a sermon series that some may recall on the book of Proverbs. Now, when we came through the book of Proverbs, you really have to deal with money when you go through the book of Proverbs because lots of Proverbs are written about wealth. And we came to the end of that, and I said, you know what? According to the book of Proverbs, there's really two reasons why God gives us money. And there's two right ways to use money. The first is security. The second is influence. Two proper uses of the tool. Money is not to be wasted on silly little things or frivolity. Two uses, security. There is nothing wrong with feeding your family. There is nothing wrong with putting a roof over your family's heads. There is nothing wrong with looking after our needs. We're called to do that. Security, even providing ourselves security in, in the form of like things like taxes, going for police and things like that. All those are legitimate uses of money, right? You need medicine? Good use of money. You need, to, you need something to uh, heat your home. You need some gas. Nothing wrong with that. Those are all good things. The second use we called secure or influence. It's something bigger than just generosity. Generosity can be just anybody who asks, I toss money at their feet. That can be generosity, but it's a little bit different than wisdom. Generosity that is used to make the world a better place is influence. That is a good use of money. Money that is given generously to change the world for the kingdom of God. Money is not to be our affection, but instead a means, like everything else in life, of bringing glory to God. It is for God's glory always. I've said as we've gone through Mark that God did not come to fix all the problems of our world, but he came to prepare a church to go out and make a difference. And this will not happen if we are consumed with desires for the things of this world. Instead, we need to learn to use wealth for security and influence and to help us learn more about God because as we use this tool for good, it teaches us about how good God is to us. How good God is to us. There is a connection between the generosity of Jesus Christ and generosity that grows in our hearts. As we learn not to be seduced by the things of this world, but keep our eyes focused on the things of heaven, on the things of Jesus. I think this widow really gave away her last sense that she had nothing then. It says all she had to live on. I'm not entirely sure. All I know is Jesus actually doesn't call the widow over and praise her. This isn't meant just to be praise towards this widow. If she gave away her last sense, maybe she should have just given away part of it if it was two copper coins. Because I'm not sure that's what Jesus is saying. Do you think Jesus is saying you should put every penny you make into the offering plate? I don't think that's what he's saying at all. I hope not. 
I give to the church. I tell you, I don't give every penny. I don't think that's what God's calling us to do. I don't think that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Because one of the things that he says we're to do with money is security. And we can't have security if we put every penny in. But I think his main focus is not so much his widow. It is those who are putting lots in, particularly those he has just attacked, the scribes, the lawyers. Back up to the story we looked at last week. Now, if you were with us, or not last week, two weeks ago, we, last time we were on Mark, we talked about this attack that Jesus made on the lawyers. And in Mark 12, 40, I didn't dwell a lot on this. But there's a phrase in here, who devour widows' houses. This comes right before he's about to praise the generosity of a widow. What does that mean, who devour widows' houses? These were the lawyers of their day. They were the judges and the prosecutors and... They, they kind of did the whole thing. They would advocate for people. They would help people. They would make judgments. And just like lawyers today, one of their jobs was to help with the preparation of estates. Can that ever be abused? You come in and say, you need to hire us for an exorbitant amount of money to come prepare your estate and you don't have any money? These scribes could come in and they could do one of two things and both were just as evil as the other. One is they could come in and say, do you know what? If you're going to pass anything on to your kids, you have to help us prepare your estate and we're going to charge you half of the estate to do it. I don't know if that was the exact figure all the time, but it was an exorbitant amount, especially for those who are poor. And it was not, we will get it after you die. It's, we need it now. And you need to occasionally update your will. And so we have to keep coming back and taking part of, a big part of your estate. Or they could do a much holier. Oh, much holier. Do you know what? You need to give this much to the temple. I'll waive my fees if you give it to you at the temple. God sounds holier, doesn't it? Except for the fact, who was in charge of the money at the temple? These scribes who could help themselves to it at any time. It sounded holier, but it was probably worse. They charged a ridiculous problem. Now, I know what's going to happen. These lawyers can come along, these scribes can come along and say, Jesus, hang on just a second. We've got to make a living too. And you know what? We do our duty. If you go to the section in Matthew, the same section in the Gospel of Matthew, he says they will even get to the point where they will grow spices in their garden with a little tiny leaf. You ever look at it like an oregano leaf? or a, a time. And, and, and they, would, they would sit there and they would count the leaves. And every tenth leaf, that would be given to Jesus. Or that would be given to God. That would go, I've done my duty. I gave my 10%. I've done what God has called me to do. I'm finished. Because isn't that what it's all about? I helped. And Jesus comes along and says, it's not about your duty, it's about your heart. I titled this sermon, True Worship. Because the bottom line is just like we talked about a few minutes ago with music, or anything else, it's not about my actions. It's about my heart. It's about what God is doing in my heart. We need to be people who give generously, who sing, pray, who help people, who volunteer, not because 
I'm just trying to get away with the minimum that I can get away with. I'm not just doing my basic duty. I'm doing things because Jesus died on a cross for my sins. Because he loves me deeply and I love him back. That's the bottom line. Proverbs 19, 7, or sorry, 14, 31. Let's give me down my notes. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. But he who is generous to the needy honors and it's very clear, him is not the needy person, honors his maker. Why do we help others? Because I share God's love for them. Later Proverbs. Whoever is generous to the poor lands to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deeds. Generosity is about doing God's work. When we give back, some might twist this verse that's on the screen behind me and some other verses say, well, if you do this, then God will give you financially. But I think it's about something much bigger than finances. These verses are particularly about the poor, about caring about the things that God cares about. We need to do that. We have many people in this room who I know are generous with the poor, who give to things like our missions, Dad Stevens, who, who encourage me and allow me to, that, that part of my work is doing things like the food bank and other things that are, are specifically to help those who are in need. Do you know what? The more we do this, the more God is at work. The more we are generous, the more we understand God's generosity. This isn't just about money. We can be generous with time, with efforts, with energy, all these things. But because money is something we often struggle with, that's why the Bible puts a big emphasis on it. When we were on our first trip to Brazzaville, we were going around through the Kinsundi neighborhood, visiting with different families, and uh, Zoe and Anne and I were one group, and we stopped by this one house, and we were doing some discipleship with this lady, and, and there was somebody else who was there, a relative or a friend or something like that, I forget exactly. And uh, we came to the end of our time there, and she said, hang on a minute before you go, I want to give you something. She ran into the house, she came out, she, she handed me a bill. She handed me some money. We're in a very poor African neighborhood. This wealthy, rich, white Canadian is being handed this money. And it was not a small bill, actually. It was actually... I mean, for us it wasn't a lot of money, but for her, I am sure it was an enormous amount. And I... I was so glad we were there with a missionary who'd been there for, for 30 plus years because I didn't know what to do. And I started refusing and Anne said, don't take it. Put, you're not going to keep it. You're going to put in the offering. Why did she say that? It's because it was more important for this woman to give. I mean, I, I did, I, not for me to keep. I certainly did not keep that money. But from the point of view that that woman was going to learn more from that than she was from even our visit. Because when we learn to be generous, God works in our lives and teaches us more about His generosity. I'm just going to put our verses back on the screen. What do we learn about generosity? Do you know what? I need to understand more and more about what God is doing in my life. I read one author this week who said, real giving involves sacrifice first. That when I'm truly being generous, it's not about the, just giving the change in my pocket. It's about making sacrifices, giving things up so that I can give. He said, secondly, real giving involves surrender. 
Because I'm giving up something that I've worked hard for, I've earned, and I'm saying I don't have control out of it anymore. It's God's. It's gone. I don't have control over something I thought I had control over. And it's learning to surrender to God. And he said, thirdly, real giving is not about what I give, but about what God can do with what I give. That God can take my pitiful little gifts and turn them into something great. There are many stories about that in the Bible. Think about earlier Mark. Kid comes, bread, fish. God feed, Jesus feeds thousands. God can do great things. Generosity is all about feeding, or sorry, about uh, following the lead of Jesus. I'm not to be judgmental about those who, who God's at work with. And I'm to understand that it's not about the accolades or praise I receive. It's not about rewards in any way. It's just about God, you're in control. Even over money. Even over money, you're in charge. You're in control. I was reading a, uh, a book this week that mentioned that this, this, the, there was a study down in the States. And they found that uh, they could increase giving in churches if a if they said, you know what, if you give X amount of dollars, we'll give you a free book. And the author wrote, and I think very wisely said, well, what kind of giver are you creating at that moment? Is it all about what I can get back out of it? Or is it about just me saying, you know, Jesus, take what I have. It's yours. It's yours. I, I, I run across a lot of people who then spend a lot of time worrying about what happens to their money. Sometimes we need to. There's a reason we publish financial reports in the church. We should be on the ball and asking questions about that. But sometimes God acts in ways we don't always expect. We just need to release it to Jesus. We need to treat the world the way Jesus treats me. We need to be passionate about the things that Jesus is passionate about. Founder of World Vision was famous for a prayer that said, God, help me to care about the things you care about. We need to be more concerned with needs that are out there than the sacrifice it takes to fix the problem. And we need to see generosity as a lifestyle not in action. Jesus sees this widow throwing these little coins into the offering. And I think his concern and his heart goes out for this woman of generosity. Someone who loved to help, maybe might have been a little more generous than she should have been. But what's the point? Is, is Jesus' point to try to make us feel guilty and to give me more? Is that, is that my point? Oh. Nobody walks away feeling that way. If, if all our motivation is trying to make people feel guilty to put more money in the offering, we go deaf to that pretty quickly. Back in the 1980s, we first had some, some pictures that would come on TV of starving children in Africa, moved everybody to, to, to give, and after a while we kind of become blind to those pictures. You know, as effective as they once were. That's what guilt does. The goal is not guilt. The goal is a deeper appreciation of the generosity that I have from Jesus. To think about how little I can give him, but how much he gives to me. And that's my motivation, because as I act like Jesus, I go deeper into the things of Jesus. 
Let's think about that as we sing number 216.